Uh, just so it's um, well known as uh, Jude, as you can see it, uh, on his t shirt. Mm. Jude is a tech artist. He is the founder of Jude oh, Studios, a creative He's tech studio focusing on virtual reality, augmented reality, and Mind Palace, a social enterprise that uses VR to help dementia patients and nursing home residents revisit from places and explore the world from the comfort and safety of their chairs keeping their minds active and slowing the effects of dementia. You want to use the restroom? He grew up as a self-taught computer programmer, for tinkering okay, with the latest fun technology when he accidentally became an artist after his photographic piece, contextualizing Da Vinci's last supper in a local poker center's setting. It went viral on the social media in 2012. That discovery with its tongue-in-cheek commentary on contemporary life in Singapore, catapulted him into the art world. Many awards and exhibitions later, he hasn't stopped creating and tickering. Thank you very much to welcome on stage, Eugene. Thank you. Hello, testing, testing. Okay, this thing is on. Hey, hello. Hello, everybody. I am Eugene So. I run two companies. One of them is Do Studios, the other one is Mind Palace. So, oh, I need a clicker. I need the clicker. So, this is me, a Eugene So. I do art and technology stuff. Um, this is an example of the kind of work that we, that we do. Last year, this was a commission by Microsoft. So we, they got us to make this installation uh, that requires four people to play. Uh, this is for uh, their conference in Orlando. So after that, after we finished this in Singapore, we had this installed in Orlando in last year for their Microsoft Ignite conference. So the, the idea behind this was to get the conference goers to meet each other because usually when people who would go for all these tech conferences, they will go alone. Their, their, their companies will send them by themselves to the tech conference. So this one is to get them to uh, mingle and get them to meet the other uh, three other people. So because this one requires four people to play, so they would, they would try to raise the flag together. And it's a motion sensor. Um, it's, it's using motion sensor to detect their movements. And they do this to try to this uh, hand movement to try to get, get the, the flags up. So this is the, the photo from, the, from Orlando. That's the installation and uh, the amount of people were, who were playing it. This, this installation was for five days. And I also gave a talk there to, to talk, talking about the technology that I use. So how I got into the art world and technology was through this, this, uh, this photograph that I made when I was in year one in university. This was 2000 and 2010. This was in 2010, I was in year one. Uh, I was from NTU, which is a local university in their fine arts course. So I was doing fine arts and in year one, in a fine arts school, we were doing all sorts of, uh, we haven't specialized yet. So we were doing like drawing and all the, all the basic art stuff. So I had a lot of free time outside. This, this was, if you don't know, this is the Last Supper. This is a recreation of Last Supper uh, in a Singapore context. So I had a lot of free time outside. I went to party, I meet, I meet people. And uh, one of them was a magazine editor who, who knows that I do some photography. And then he asked me, hey, Eugene, why don't, you, why don't you put some of your photos, one of your photos in our center foot page? So at that time, I, I, was, I was so excited. This year one, as a year one university student, some magazine company wants to put my photograph in their centerfold page. I was very excited. So I looked through my portfolio of pho photographs. It was, uh, I was very disappointed with myself because uh, it was all like um, very pretentious stuff, like shadows of flowers on the floor, like a whole series of that. So I couldn't pick out one picture to put in the centerfold page. Um, so I decided to shoot a new one a uh, new, uh, new which was this. And then it was published in the magazine, great. Then uh, for two years, nobody cared about it. I went to major in interactive media, which is 
very much uh, very the most techy version, the most techy major of the of the fine arts course, which was we were doing programming, making games. Then two years later, when I was doing uh, interactive media, the that picture went viral on Facebook. I don't know what happened. Maybe Facebook Facebook's algor algorithm changed, and then it went viral. So. After that, the, the next day, people started contacting me. Not, uh, not just people, like galleries. Galleries were contacting me, asking me, hey, let's see more of your work. But little did they know that this was the only one. So I could have, I could have been the guy to like, tell them, hey, don't disturb me, I am going to be a programmer. My, my game plan at the time was, five year plan at the time was to like, go and work at maybe Blizzard or one of those big gaming companies and be one of their, one of their game designers. Well, I could have been the guy to tell him, don't disturb me. But I went to oblige them and I, and I did solo shows. And I had my first solo show when I graduated. And, and then after that, the media started print. Uh, this, this went out in the media and, uh, and they started calling me Eugene, Eugene So, the photographer. And I didn't like that because this was just one of the small projects that I did. And they started labeling me as this photographer as if it was my entire life but no, no I, I still did a lot of programming stuff so after this I was trying to run away from the title of photographer for a super long time and I think I managed to do that and this series was forgotten again until last year Singapore Tourism Board they decided to uh, that they wanted to use this to fly the Singapore flag around around the, Singapore, uh, around the world so they, they sent this to Russia um, this was also in Russia and Myanmar, to five different countries, uh, Vietnam, India, Bangkok. And they, they know that I do technology. They know that I do technology and they know that I did these work. So they wanted me to incorporate technology with these five, master, uh, these five uh, works that I did in the past. So they wanted to do augmented reality on top of it. So at first I was telling them, no, augmented reality uh, the, the stuff that I did in the past, right, for my exhibitions, we would make the, the AR stuff, put it on the App Store and Google Play. And then during the exhibition, we would have to beg people to download it on their phones or, or use it on our own iPads to show them. And then nobody would download a new app on their phone for your exhibition. So I was actually discouraging them from doing it. Then they were telling me that there was this new way of doing AR. Where, where you don't require people to download, uh, download an app, they can use their existing one, which is uh, their existing app, which was on Facebook. So I did not believe them, but I, but I went home and tested it anyway, and they were right. There was this new AR platform where do, uh, they don't require people to download the, an app, and they can use it straight away on their phone. They just need a link. And so the, I made a prototype in two days, and then they said, okay, let's do that and we had the exhibition in one month later. So they commissioned five, five of the works. The idea was to, to let the works become like a Harry Potter portrait. When you point your phones at it, they come to life and bring new meaning to it. So after, after I discovered this platform, with the help of uh, Singapore Tourism Board and Chan Hori, which was my representing gallery at the time, I went to explore the, the platform further. I made AR portals in, in, my, in my house. So this was a little portal that when you point to the floor, this doorway will, will open and you can enter Mars. The Mars, this Mars 360 uh, photo was from NASA. Then I went to try other things like AR rise my nip, to censor my nipples or to let people become Yusuf Ishak on our, our Singapore $50 note. So this was, a, this was still in a beta period of, for, for Facebook even. They were all testing this. So everything that we tested was the first time anyone has done it at that time. Then after that, I got more commercial work. Th those two projects were all like uh, personal projects. Then, then Singapore Tourism Board got me to do one for Tiger Beer. Tiger Beer is a a beer that was from Singapore, but they have, bought, they have been, they are now owned by a non-Singaporean company, but they, are, they, are, they want to remind people uh, that, that they are from Singapore. So these are all iconic buildings in Singapore. So when you point your phones at the bottles, they become these iconic buildings. Then more, more, 
more commercial projects. This was for um, so this was for uh, Active SG, uh, the sports ministry in Singapore. So this is their mascot, and then which never existed in three D until I came along. They they they, they gave me like two D references, uh, flat two D references, and then they got me to turn it into a three D game where you get to play soccer with Nila. And then there's, there's also Sengkang Hospital, which opened last year. They got me to do something like this. When you point at the sculpture in the middle of the, the, the hospital, cherry blossoms come out. And because a sculpture has different ways of looking at it, from another angle of the sculpture, you will see another view. So this is fishes, and then there's a third angle. So our, our prime minister was there for the opening, and he tried it out for himself. But I, at that time, I wasn't able to be there to shake his hand because I was in Hanoi for the Singapore Tourism Board thing. So, yeah, I missed out. So this is another project. This was for uh, Love Bonito, a clothing retail shop that opened recently in uh, Funan. Or oh, they, they opened for a very really long time. This is a new branch that opened in, at, at uh, a, sh a new shopping mall in Singapore. So we got they got us to do this with their get get the their shop to turn into this flower field. All those projects were all on Facebook, and then and because of because of all those projects, right? Uh, when Facebook decided to open up on Instagram to let people uh, do Instagram filters, they let me be one of the first few beta testers. Like there were only like twenty beta testers in the whole world to be on the Instagram beta to do Instagram filter uh, to do filters on Instagram so they let me uh, in as part of first 20 so I made the second custom Instagram in the entire world and, and now it's open to everybody back then it was it was closed you know as as as, as a private thing so does anyone um, make Instagram filters or use Insta use Instagram filters yes there's do you use or make Instagram filters? I use you use them. Ah, okay, cool. So, yes, awesome, awesome. So the 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 number of views on Instagram filters is is very significantly different from from Facebook filters. Facebook filters, nobody usually uses the Facebook camera to to do selfies, but Instagram is quite crazy. You get millions of impressions in in a few days. So we also made. This one for Indonesia's Independence Day. So this is a game that, that um, they have this tradition of climbing this oily pole every national day to go and get prizes on top. So they, they told me about this. Uh, <laughs> is anyone controlling volume? Can we turn it down a little bit? Anyone controlling volume? Is anyone controlling the volume? Um, maybe I must do it here. So, so they got me to convert their... They got me to convert their game into... Their tradition into, a, into an Instagram game and this went super viral in, in, Insta, on, in Indonesia. So this was detecting the mouth movements actually. So you didn't really have to say Merdeka but the... When, when the campaign launched and then they're supposed to, we got them to actually uh, say Madeka because they, they have to record the video. If they don't say it, then that's cheating. And then we did one for McDonald's recently. This was a simple one for Hello Kitty. And then uh, the, the Hello Kitty thing sold out the next day once it, once it uh, launched. So we went on, after those were all commercial projects, I, I still remember that I want to do uh, personal work. And so this one, I made a, a Minecraft filter on Instagram so you can build your own Minecraft thing. So there is uh, different materials you can start building. Then recently on, on, recently on Instagram, there was one type of filter that went super viral and everyone started using it, which was the, which Disney are you? kind of filter or the which, uh, which whatever are you. So I was very annoyed with that because that, that kind of filter is super easy to make. And, and the kind of 
stuff that I do is so so technical. So I wanted to uh, I wanted to create a filter that blasts all this random. Oh, and by the way, those those filters they don't analyze anything on your face. They just give you a random character. It's completely random. It doesn't relate to doesn't mean anything. So a lot of people think that oh it analyzes your face and matches you, uh, but it doesn't. So I was super annoyed that uh, that people were uh, people were using it as if it was it meant something, but it doesn't mean anything. So I wanted to create a a filter just like that one to blast to blast them. <laughs> so while I was doing this, I took time out of my commercial work to do this. So I, in the end, I decided to turn, tweak my concept a bit. Instead of blasting them, I blast negativity because I was feeling very negative at the time. I was like, oh, what is all this people? Yeah. So I decided to turn it into, to join them and make my own randomized filter, but with more, uh, more technical, uh, make it a bit more technical. So dude.sg, well, oh, if, if you want to try this filter, you can go to my Instagram dude.sg uh, and go and there's a filter tab and you can go and try it now. So why my dude.sg? So at that time, I was very early in the in the website game. I was a web developer for ages uh, for about twelve years, or even more than that. Uh, Fifteen years. I was doing I was doing commercial jobs, and then uh, I went to go and check out all the. I went, I had eugenesoul.com at first, but it didn't roll well on the tongue. Like when I wanted to tell people, oh, that's my website, eugenesoul.com, it just doesn't, it just feels too boring. So I wanted to change my website domain. So I went to check out the .sg domain and turns out do.sg was available. And I was very surprised that, that I could get such a short domain name, do.sg. Uh, I'm a dude, I'm from Singapore, so it makes sense. Um, then I went to check out other one-worded .sg domains. There were so many, nobody took them. So I did the most logical thing and I bought them all. <laughs> so I own the most number of .sg domains, uh, one-worded .sg domains uh, in Singapore. So, and I didn't just squat on them, I also have webart.sg and, uh, and being a web developer making boring websites for corporates, right? I was, uh, I was, itching to make my own nonsense website, like a website where the button will run away from your mouse cursor. When you try to click it, it will run away. I want to make that kind of thing. And I know other web developers, they want a platform. They're just waiting for an excuse to do something like that. Like more like someone to give them a deadline to do it. Otherwise, when if there's no deadline for all these personal projects, you will just wait for the next day, wait for the next day. So, so with this platform, I. I got 20 artists to sign up for, to adopt a domain, and then I gave them a deadline. You will have one year, which was quite long, one year to, to finish your project. So at the end of the year, they, they made some amazing works. Pick.sg, date.sg, and, and, when, and 2013, I already had one foot in the art world. So I was going around galleries asking them, hey, do you want to exhibit these, uh, these 20 artists from around the world? Some, uh, it's not just Singaporeans. Um, there were people from around the world. So um, they thought, hey, this is such a good idea. But being commercial galleries, they need to be able to sell the, the website. So I was thinking of actually printing out, printing out the websites in a Chinese scroll format and letting people scroll through the website physically. I thought that was a very clever idea. But uh, they, they said that they couldn't sell the Chinese scroll. And if they exhibited my 20 artists, for whatever period of time, one month, then they, they don't make anything for that one month. So I felt defeated again. But I remember that I'm a developer, I can solve my own problems. So I, and I have gallery.sg also. So I decided to adopt gallery.sg and make my own online gallery. And I wanted to recreate the whole gallery visiting experience, but online. So when people go onto the website, I want them to be able to see whoever is there at the same time. So it's the, it became like a multiplayer online game. So I got a, a rented server, and whoever who went to gallery.sg, they'll pop into this 3D world, and they'll walk around with the first-person shooter kind of uh, way, like with like Counter-Strike, 
WASD key and the mouse and then everybody will be holding these pretentious wine glasses and going around clinking. Uh, when they click, they actually like do a, do a clink. So they will, they will, this was from the opening day, 70, uh, about 70 people from around the world came, came by. My server crashed two, three times. Um, so this was, this kind of uh, remote social thing was what I wanted to bring to the elderly in, in uh, nursing homes because they're all stuck inside a nursing home. They, um, they can't go out too much. And why wouldn't it be nice if there was a place where they could go to? And this is where my second company comes in, more like, more like charity. So Mind Palace, VR for dementia. So the problem that we are addressing here is the loss of agency. So for, for your own grandmas or, or other grandmas, when they are at home, they have this illusion that they can go out and make friends. Maybe, um, maybe they are, their mobility might not be so well, but they still have this illusion that they can go out and they can go wherever they want. But after you put, they go into a nursing home, for whatever reason they go into a nursing home, suddenly the walls are more prominent. When, you want to, when they want to go out, there is a security guard telling you, oh no, go back, go back to, uh, you can't go out. Or, and also like deciding on their meals, all these basic choices, someone else decides it, decides it for them. What time you eat, what, time, what you eat is all decided for them. So when, after living in a nursing home, they start to become more passive because all their choices doesn't matter. Someone else decides it for them. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if there was a place where they could make all these choices and do whatever they want, but still stay within the safety of their nursing home. And that, that place was virtual reality. So I first started bringing my virtual reality goggles to the elderly uh, beginning of last year. And it was, uh, it was, I was using a phone inside the Google Cardboard, the really cheap ones, and then I let them uh, look around. So those had a lot of issues on its own. So being a developer, I want to solve problems, so I went on to solve even more problems. And after, after a while, Channel News Asia got wind of it and they decided to feature me on a one hour episode uh, on their station. They got me to teach four elderly people how to make a virtual reality game. So we, we made a VR game. I turned it into a wheelchair racing game. And then after that, I pretty much became the the VR guy for old people in Singapore. So how it works is we introduce the, the VR goggles to the, to the elderly and then tell them uh, that it's okay. And then so otherwise they are like, uh, they, they are a bit afraid of it. They don't know what's, whether it's gonna take out their eyes or anything. So we tell them, oh, it's nothing. You just put it on. And then they, once they put it on, they are transported to places like, oh, Great Wall of China or wherever. So the, we, we found that it can bring them uh, back to familiarity. This is especially good for the dementia patients. We, we shoot old Singapore scenes, places that they might have seen while they were growing up. And then we let, them, we let them see it. So they will feel nostalgia. For dementia patients, they will suddenly feel at home again uh, compared to where they are now, where it's all very foreign because they, their minds are stuck in the past. They only remember the things of the past. We can bring them calm, we can let them travel and we can bring them uh, some excitement. So we, I tested like the more exciting stuff like roller coasters and, uh, and those, are terrible, those are terrible for the old people because it really feels very immersive. They will be, so, they will be super scared. So I want to advise them uh, letting them sit on a VR roller coaster. Even though in real life, they're just sitting down on their bed. Uh, it is very real for them. So after a while, we uh, are doing all this VR. Society for the Ages Sick, they, they, they suggested including food into it. I thought that was a great idea because with food, then suddenly we can, it's not only the audio and visual, it is the touch, taste, smell. So for this, in this case, right, we let them watch uh, Hawker Chan, our Michelin star chicken rice uh, man. He's very, he's, he's very famous uh, for his chicken rice, so we got him to introduce the chicken rice to the elderly. And then when they're watching it, they can smell the chicken rice also. They don't know why they can smell it, but it's, they think it's the technology. But it's because during these sessions, uh, Hawker Chan would sponsor 
400, uh, 40 packs of chicken rice, 100 packs of chicken rice that we will bring to the nursing home and then we'll hide it at one corner first. Then while they are watching, we, we sneak it out and so that they can smell. And then after this, they have this uh, memorable experience for them. So the, I, this one really, this was quite popular. Uh, this was very popular actually. Everybody wants some more. I wish we had uh, more uh, capacity to do it, to do more of these sessions. And uh, there's a lot of uh, food, um, food vendors who want to collaborate with us and, and sponsor. So there is a, there is a want to help uh, these people. So more innovations like uh, to include exercise into this uh, VR wheelchair racing game. I made another prototype. Uh, I improved the prototype, but there was one uh, there was one problem in VR that I still can't solve, and the only way to solve it is that everybody has their own VR headset, and that problem is the hygiene. So for now, I will bring my VR headset to the to the elderly uh, nursing home, and then they will all share it. They pass it along, but uh, we'll have the hygiene mask and and everything, but. There is still, there's still a lot of intimacy to their face. It's, it's something on their face. So if one person has conjunctivitis the, uh, that day, everybody risks getting conjunctivitis. And these are vulnerable people. They are the elderly. So we, we wouldn't want to do that for, for, for them. So I am moving away from VR and going to bigger screens. For this wheelchair racing game, we turn it to something like Daytona and you race with a screen instead. And for our upcoming project with NTUC Health, we are building an immersive room um, where this was a prototype that I made in Bali during one of my artist residencies. Uh, so this, this one was with uh, three curtains. We had it projected on three curtains, but for the real one that we're building now, it's going to be on, on actual walls. And uh, more projects to show you. This one. So I've done many, many projects. It'll, be, it'll, it'll, it'll take a long time for, for me to go through all of them. But this one here, right, I did a while ago. And I didn't think of bringing it to the elderly until I saw, until I saw a viral video. Uh, until I saw a viral video of someone teaching uh, the elderly how to do boxing. OK, the video will load. Let's see. So I made a, a Kinect boxing game <laughs> a, a while ago. And the reason why I made this Kinect boxing game was because uh, the Xbox games that I, I have seen that time, right? Yeah, it involves, it will detect you doing a punch. So you do a punch and then the, the, the character on screen will do their own version of the punch. I thought, why, why are they doing their own version? Why can't they just do whatever you're doing? The technology is good enough for that. So I searched high and low for a game like that and Microsoft or whoever did not build a game like that. So I went to build it on my own. So whatever way you do a helicopter arm swing, the character on screen will do a helicopter arm swing and, and they will register, re, it will register the hits if you have contact with the, the opponent's body or, or head. So, so for, for my game, you punch towards the screen and then the, the, the characters will punch each other. So I didn't think of bringing it to the elderly until I saw that, that video. Then let's go to the next. Then this is another one that we did recently for, for Standard Chartered. The, there was a night marathon race in Singapore uh, two months ago. So they, not everybody gets to run a marathon. So during the, during the marathon, the people who are on the side cheering, we let them experience what it's like to finish the, the marathon. So that was the idea for them, for, for, this, uh, for this installation. Okay. So this was also the first 
uh, stand chart night marathon. Uh, I'm glad that it was at night because otherwise it would be too hot and too bright for us to make an installation. So this one, you jog on the spot and then the, it would be best if there was a thread mill, but their budget didn't allow it. So we just let them jog on the spot and they will experience what it's like to uh, this pre-recorded version of what we, what we made. So you can see all my team members are all there. And one of my team members is here, Casey, my new business manager at the back there. So that's my developer. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> So I guess you are you're asking first? Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Is have a question? Since you said that uh, you've been called... Cup, cup, cup. Sorry? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, you've been called a uh, different way of guide. You've been the photograph guide, then the VR guide, then the dude guide. Mm -hmm. Is there one you which identify the most or do you feel like a completely different person? Uh, the, the one I identify the most with is the artist. So art and tech. Art and tech guy, that, that is my preferred title, art and tech guy, yes. And I have another question to follow up. Um, what led you, what, what, what were you feeling when you had to change like, um, as you said before, you had to go to different places to show up, showcase your VR and then uh, move from there to uh, your company. What drove you to do that? What, what were you feeling? Oh, what drove me to set up my own company was more for administrative reasons because after I did like big projects for the government, they were like saying, oh, so you have a company, right? We'll pay through your company. So I was like, no, I don't have a company. You gotta pay me as an individual. Then they're like, no, we can't do that because they're government agencies. So they require me to have a company. So it is more out of necessity. So I, like, oh, I went through the whole process, register a company, name myself as the boss. And then, and the whole company only has one person at that time. So it's just me. Name, what is your uh, name? My name is Artist Tree. Artist Tree. Yeah. Wow, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a word, right? Artist Tree, that's, a, that's an actual word. Um, first place is quite heavy. In the last video you showed, the guy wasn't wearing any sensor, it was nothing I could see. How, do you, how was it tracked? It was uh, using the Kinect sensor so that you don't need to wear anything. Uh, you can, it will detect you detect all your body positions. So I have one installation now in National Gallery. If you go visit the National Gallery uh, one of these days, on the City Hall wing, level four, the Architecture Gallery, there are these two big projections in the corridor. You can go there and you can try this virtual tour that I made for them a few years ago. So it's still exhibited now. You can go and test that out. You don't have to touch the installation. Uh, this was, they, they got me the, they commissioned that more for like, maintenance issues. They wanted a VR thing at first and then they said that, oh, I, I told them the VR thing, after people use it many times, it will break down and we'll have to change it. So they, we came up with a new idea and using the motion sensor. So there's no need to touch the thing and then, and so far it's been running for two years, it hasn't broken down once. Uh, the second question is, uh, with the machines coming in, there's already the issue that they are moving away from and 
Oh wait, sorry, I uh, couldn't hear. What, what was it again? Oh, so technology, her question is whether technology would move away from human contact, would might negate, or would, would minimize human contact, and whether that is an issue to me. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, that is something I've been thinking about also, which is why um, when I was making my VR stuff, my end goal is for them to increase their social, their social reach. So is, is it, it is through technology, then they get to meet other people outside of their nursing homes. They get to meet uh, other people from maybe another different country actually. So I, I find that the way that I use it, it will let, allow them to meet more people actually, to create a community online. It might not be, it might not be like human face-to-face -face interaction with the touching and everything, but it is, they get more reach. They get more reach and they get, get to meet more, more people, more diverse people and not just people inside their nursing home. So my name is Timo. Uh, I saw that you had a lot of projects about bringing the technology to elderly people or disabled people. So uh, you could have uh, committed your art to uh, you know, a lot of uh, to topical issues, of, but why was this one important and um, bridging the, the technology gap and bringing technology to, to elderly people? Uh, so your question was... What, why is this particular you know, Why was it important uh, for you to, to act uh, for, for this film? Why was it important for me to act on, or for the elderly? Why did I choose the elderly as one of my, the group of people to help? Is that the question? Why is it important to you to come into art to bring technology to isolated or elderly people? Ah, so why did I bother using technology to help? this particular group of people? Ah, okay, very good question. So um, as, a, as a technology guy, I do a lot, of, a lot of projects. So I actually help a lot of other groups of people like minorities and, and, and elderly. So this was one of the projects that I said yes to. I, I like to solve problems. So when one, when one of my friends, uh, he is a journalist for the Straits Times, he was a journalist for the Straits Times and he did an investigative journalism piece where he spent one month in a nursing home. And then after that, he came out, he asked me, hey, why, why didn't you bring your VR goggles to the elderly? I think they would really appreciate that because him, after spending one month in there, he felt like there, there was a need to escape from the, from the four walls that were, that were there. So I brought it in and then after that, we did a few, a few tests and uh, it pretty much, took off. So there's a lot of projects that I would try and then it would just stay there. It would just stagnate and nobody cared about it. So this was one of the projects that I would try the same, I'll put in the same amount of effort, but then it just suddenly took off. And then it, and then it, um, Tomasic, the Singapore uh, big investment arm, they, they took interest in it and they invested. Uh, they, gi they gave me some funding, angel funding. They, did, they, didn't, they didn't take equity because they supported it. And after that, it became its own company and now it's its, its own thing. Yes. So that is the reason. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Satya. I have uh, two questions. Satya. Satya. Safia. Safia. Yes. Safia. Um, thank you for your presentation first. Um, and then uh, I can imagine that when you were uh, working on your project, you had some challenges. Mm -hmm. Um, and you managed to pass all, all of them. I mean, the first picture you took, um, it took two years, I think, to get viral. Yes. So during this period of time, nothing was happening in this file. How were you able to keep believing in your project and keep saying that it's going to happen one day? Oh, it, I didn't believe in it. I forgot about it. And then it just went viral. So while, is that during, very good question. So during that two years, I just kept doing a lot of projects. So. It's just non-stop doing projects. If, if it goes viral, so be uh, then very good. I wouldn't like do one project and hold it very precious to me. Like this one is the one that will go viral. I don't do that. So I would do it, put it online, and then move on to the next one really quickly. So I would just keep churning up. Uh, if there's a cool project coming in, I'll do it. I would quickly uh, do the, a nice documentation, put it online, and then I will stop thinking about it and then do a, next, a new one. So I guess, 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like, this project is the one to make me make or break my career. I don't do that. I'll just keep creating. I mean, as, a, as an artist, that is what I live for, to create. I don't, I don't expect any of my works to go viral. Okay, that's happening. Yeah. And my second question is, um, when you were working on your project and you had all that ideas about pictures and uh, uh, web and all the... Web, this design. AR, VR. How did you manage to take it from your own world to a real company with a business manager and web developer and all a team? I guess how I managed to do it is with every, every year I make more and more uh, revenue. Somehow I, I managed to have more confidence to charge more. So it went from when I first started out, when I was still a student, I was charging people, oh, $500 to do a, no, actually $2,000 to do a, pro, do a website. And now my going rate is about 10K to 30K per project. So with, with more funding from, from all these projects, I'm able to hire people and expand a lot. I was, I was very reluctant to, to hire people because I'm like, I can do all the things myself. I'm like very determined to do everything myself. But ever since I got my first proper hire, uh, early last year, I'm like, oh, actually this guy is very capable. I can offload a lot of stuff to him. Then after that, a second hire, third hire, now fourth hire. So, and, then, uh, and then moving out from my, from my house, I was doing everything from, from home, where now I have I moved out to, a, to an actual office already, where my staff is now working now. Yeah, so that is, I guess it was from having more money, yeah. Just from having more money. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.